Well, let's talk about attic. I think many of you out there may not even think about that term. If you started Greek and you were reading attic, probably nobody told you that it was attic because that's Greek by default. Right. And attic, it's uh, named after the region that is dominated by Athens and it's a geographically um, self-contained region, Attica. And in the fifth and fourth century BCE, what people spoke in Attica would be Attic. Why? Because uh, Athens dominates the whole region. And because Athens was as culturally dominant as it was, Attic eventually becomes the language that everybody thinks is Greek. Although I love the definition of uh, Meye, mm -hmm. who says Koine, which is the language of the Septuagint and the New Testament, Koine is Attic spoken by Ionians. Hmm. So that has to do with the conquests of Alexander the Great, and we don't want to get into that because we'll be here for hours if we do that. But I just introduced another uh, dialect name, which is Ionian. And Ionian is the major dialect that is represented in Homeric poetry. But even there, it doesn't stop. If you go backward in time, uh, if you can't say it in Ionian, then you have to say it in earlier ways, and um, the next phase or stage of dialect evolution would be Aeolian, or um, we'll leave it at that, Aeolian, mm -hmm, right. um, or Aeolic, spoken by Aeolians. That's another way we could say it. Yeah, if you, you said if you can't say it in Ionian Greek, you say it in Aeolian, it's, it's like, it also gives you different ways of saying the same thing. And you right. know, the, the, um, I'm so glad you caught me on that because as I was saying it, <laughs> I was already thinking I should have said it the other way. If, uh, if you're thinking of this uh, system, this language that we now call Homeric poetry moving forward in time, right. not backward in time, and that's much more comfortable, then I want to say it the other way is, well, you know, we're Aeolians and we're we're using this uh, poetic language, but um, uh, as as uh, this language starts being used also by Ionian speakers, right. uh, what you can tell an Ionian is, well, if you can't say it in Aeolic, say it in Ionic. Yeah, exactly. I, I like that better. Uh -huh. yes. That's much more refined, and thank you for, yeah. for catching me on that. But Keith's question is, are there same. alternative ways of saying the same thing? So, yeah. so, but they're they're alternative in the sense that they're metrically alternate, right? Meaning that they're different metrically. Metrically, yes. So that they fit into different parts of the verse. Um, so you don't have you don't have redundance redundance, uh, perfect redundance in terms of vocabulary and meter, is something that's generally ruled out. Although there are examples, but but you have cases where. Uh, you, if you can say the same thing in, mm -hmm. in we're using a, uh, a neolic form, it gives you an alternative way of fitting it into the line. So, so mm -hmm. it expands the the flexibility of the poetic language. Is there an example yes. that springs to mind? Uh, Podesi, in the dative uh, plural, mm -hmm. that's uh, eolic. Yeah. And or, uh, I'm yeah. not sure that the ionic form occurs, but it would be different if posi. Or simple oh, things like hey yeah. man and hey mean, right? This is yes, the, the dative right. of the of the form, the form that means for to a for us. Okay, yes. occurs a lot. So you have one way it's two uh, stressed or long syllables, and the other it's long and a short, stressed and unstressed. But but Keith's question also brings us to something that can really make people very discouraged about learning uh, Homeric language, which is that. Uh, 
if you look at the genitive singular of a given pronoun, there may be five, six, seven different ways of saying yes. it. And you because say, the oh my versatility God, is a key. Th this yeah. is not a systematic language. Well, yes it is, yeah. because everything fits where it should fit. Um, and it, Lenny used the word meter, that's very important, um, because we all come from a tradition uh, that was pioneered by uh, Milman Perry and continued by Albert Lord, uh, people like the three of us speak not only about meter but also about formula. And one thing that uh, I know all three of us are sensitive about and sensitive to is the idea that the meter made the poet say something. No, the meter didn't make the poet say something. The poet is already using a language that has rules and we can describe those rules by showing what fits where and meter is of course the rhythmical unit into which the words fit. But it's not as if uh, the poet is trying to figure out how am I going to fit this into such and such a metrical position. No, the poet is, is speaking a language which is a meta-language better ways of saying it, it's a super language. Super language, mm -hmm. I think. How about great. a super yeah. language, yeah, not a meta great. language, a super language. Huh. And, and this super language is even more um, efficient than our everyday languages are. Yeah. Yeah. And it is just uh, beautifully designed for expressing truths about um, life and about civilization that uh, can be extended backwards in time to what uh, a thousand years earlier, two thousand years earlier, over which time it evolved and evolved. But it evolves, yeah. and 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 just as language evolves, and just as in English, if we have to use the plural of ox, it's oxen and not oxes. oxes yep. <laughs> um, similarly, there are all sorts of things that um, that are not just preserved. That makes it sound. Uh, to formaldehyde-like, uh, but, yeah. but perpetuated and sustained uh, in this language. And it's great for uh, people who call themselves historical linguists, because historical linguists can, can track things that are going on and can reach back with their discovery procedures, their reconstruction, mm. going back again a thousand years, two thousand years, maybe more. Yeah. 